Welcome everyone to another edition of Beyond Sunday, but this is the first ever edition of the Parenting Podcast. I'll be hosting, I'm Peter Bay, Director of Next Gen here at King of Kings, um, but just coming in very soon in January, I'm flipping over to Director of our first uh, multi-site campus. So uh, that's going to be a big change for me, but still, I'm a parent of three, and uh, this is a... a Parent, learning how to parent better is important for all of us, and I need it. So excited to get this started. I'm here with today's guest, Dr. Tim Riley, clinical psychologist. Holy smokes. Author of several books, newest being Unstuck. Tell us about that quick. So uh, How to Live an Unstuck Life is a book uh, intended mainly for adults about stress, anxiety, more significant anxiety. But. How to, how to live unstuck. What's the reading level of that book? Uh, probably upper high school or better. Okay, I'll have someone read that to me. That'd be uh, great. Um, there's, and, there's an audio edition coming that should oh, be helpful there is? to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's such good news. <laughs> Wonderful. So you can check out that. But where can we find unstuck? Uh, on Amazon.com uh, where you can find all of your needs. All right. I've, I've, I've heard of Amazon before. Uh, Dr. Tim Riley is, and I also play in uh, the the best bluegrass group in all of King of Kings. And if we, if you have a bluegrass group at King of Kings that we don't know about, we would love to compete with you. We'll battle the bands. We're also the worst bluegrass band in King of Kings. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, not you, you have a good point. Today we're and and today's episode we're going to talk out about parenting out of COVID. We are two and a half years into one of the strangest moments in our in the history of the world um there have been other pandemics but none that we've experienced so um intimately as we did with covid and it's had an effect on everyone including kids and so um dr tim riley we often hear that like kids are so resilient and like they can overcome anything they get sick and they're better a couple days later they they don't uh they get a broken bone they won't even complain about it they kids are so resilient and uh is now in the case of covid and what they've gone through for the last couple two and a half years is that still the case is that true uh sure i mean it depends um the the idea of resilience is the ability to bounce back from some stressor so the, the distinction that I make all the time is between stress in the sort of mechanical sense, which would be, uh, you know, what happens when any force is applied to something else, and stress when it's applied to people. So you could think of uh, a used Toyota, and you're sitting in the back seat, and somebody's outside piling bricks on the roof one at a time. Those are stressors. Each one of those adds stress. And if you're in the back seat, then they add a little stress to you too. At some point, there's a brick that causes that roof to deform, and it's no longer able to function as it did before. Um, the same is true for people. Uh, we can tolerate a lot of stress, but for everybody, there's a point at which our performance starts to be affected by the amount of stress. And so then resilience is the ability to bounce back from that stress. Well, that implies that the stress stops at some point. So if uh, we continue to recover most of our systems and most of what we do after COVID, then sure, kids would be expected to bounce back and to be resilient. And, and is there like a time frame for resilience? I mean, like um, with the broken bone example, it's like, so my son Benton, he, mm -hmm. it, he, he really should have hundreds of broken bones. He's only broken one. Mm -hmm. It was actually two. It was like a clean break of, you, you should watch him a little more closely <laughs> of those two. We, we, you know what? It's just too much stress to watch him. <laughs> um, so we just let him be. And then if we hear screams, we check on him. And one time he had both of his like major bones in his arm were broken. E it was gross. And, uh, there was like an angle and then too many angles for arms. And he, uh, but he wore casts for, I mean, they had to set it, um, they put him under, he wore a cast for six weeks, and then he was, like, good to go. Yeah. Um, is there a, a length of time where it starts to affect us more, where our resilience fades, or, or our body kicks into a different gear? But, uh, there's always an opportunity to bounce back. So unlike the roof of a Toyota, which needs a body shop to fix it, you know, human beings are more like a... Uh, uh, you know, memory foam mattress. 
you know, we stay pressed down for a long time, but then if the stressor goes away or lessens, we tend to bounce back. So under any but the most extreme circumstances, particularly kids bounce back very quickly. And, and for the most part, I mean, we want to keep in mind that most of our concerns about COVID don't necessarily show up on the radar of kids. They just know, okay, I put on a mask. Okay, fine. Everybody's putting on a mask. I got a mask on. Fine, let's go do this thing, whatever it is. And so how they react is to a large extent a reflection of how their parents and other adults around them react. Wow. So if a parent is carrying all the stress of, I don't want to wear a mask, um, and they they fight that every single step along the mm. way, the kid's going to really more so reflect that. Um, whereas the mask in the first place for a kid, they'll just go with the floor and wear the mask. Yeah. Benton doesn't know from virus. He's, I'm sick. I'm not sick. My right. arm's broken. It's not broken. Right. Uh, whatever. He's just going about his day, you know, and, and living in, in the moment. We as adults think further ahead. We understand the broader implications of the virus, all of those kind of things. Yeah. So uh, if we get stressed by that, then stress is contagious, and kids pick up on that, and they react according to how they see their parents react. So in this Beyond Sunday episode of uh, talking about parenting out of COVID, um, our goals for this episode are to, one, give some just practical knowledge and tips like you've already been giving, um, and then two, to help us parents um, and and anyone really to be a bit encouraged out of this, maybe because knowledge is power and you, we know more about it, or maybe because we have some practical tools in how to relate to our kids. Um, so here's the next question. What, if any, effects will be on this generation of kids who survived COVID? Um, multiple levels. And again, how long they take to recover from each of those areas depends on how severely they were affected, but um, certainly there are a number of social effects, particularly for younger kids who are just learning how to socialize or to communicate and who've gone through this period of everybody being masked up and they're not able to see other people's facial expressions. They're not able to watch their lips move as they're communicating. So you have some kids who are behind the curve in terms of socialization. They've been at home watching classes on uh, uh, on their iPad instead of uh, interacting with other human beings on the playground. It takes a while to remediate those kind of things. And there are probably some things where there's a, a, a developmental window, right? If they don't acquire those skills during a particular developmental time, it's harder to go back and get them later on, right? They're, they're prepared uh, during a particular developmental time. And if you miss that window, then it's harder. So are you saying that they'll like never get those skills or it's just going, they'll get them later? Than it, it's others? just harder. Yeah. Yeah. And, and potentially never, but I mean, I don't think you're talking about people who are in, entirely asocial, you know, it's just that they're not as skilled or they miss some of the nuances that they would have gotten. So when you and I are talking here, you're saying things, but you're also nodding your head and you're giving me facial expressions. So there's a le <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, there's a level of communication that goes on beyond words, and a lot of that has been lost. Um, and, and so it takes a while to to remediate some of that. Some language based things are harder to get if you don't get them at the appropriate developmental age. So there's potentially some longer term deficiencies in some of that. Um, definitely some mental health implications when things change a lot or things are uncertain. And, and again, if that uncertainty is reflected in the parents toward mm -hmm. the kids, people get uncomfortable. People get anxious when they're not able to predict what's going on. And then that anxiety begins to be more the focus of what's going on than day-to-day -day life. So the incidence of anxiety and depression is certainly up in kids post-COVID. Um, but, but those things can be remediated. So what does that look like? If I'm a parent who's like, ooh, is my kid anxious? I mean, what are some things, what, what can I be looking for to, I, to help identify if my kid is going through anxiety? So um, if they're asking for a lot more reassurance than they used to, um, are, are, am I okay? Is okay, Dad, where are you going to be? What time are you going to be home? And you give them the answer, and that's like, okay, you're sure you're going to be home? Or am I okay? Is mom okay? Um, if they stop attending things, activities um, that they used to really enjoy, and they don't do that anymore, 
and, and they don't have a clear sort of rational reason for doing that, just it doesn't feel comfortable to them uh, to do that, then that's a strong indicator that they're feeling anxious about that, that the uncertainty of that moment has become the dominant factor in how they think about it. So if we notice those things in our kid or any of these challenges coming out of COVID, what, what can we do as parents to step in and, and help? So, I mean, in the broadest sense, and this, this really goes to the bigger issue of how do you respond to, to COVID in general, um, is you maintain as much continuity as you can. If unpredictability is the breeding ground of anxiety, then predictability offsets that. Mm -hmm. So you revert back to what are the most common and most important, in my view, um, principles of parenting, which is, uh, you know, you're consistent, you're reliable, you protect, but you don't pamper, uh, you give kids an opportunity to fail in a, in a comfortable way, um, you, you are where you are supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there, all of those kind of things. They should know they, that they can count on you and they're, you're going to respond to them in a way that you always have predictably, but also getting back to routines and structure and traditions to the extent that circumstances allow. So life just feels more normal or as normal as you can make it. So you said allowing your kids to fail. Uh, what does that give an example of what that could look like? Um, so th there's a regrettable sort of impulse on the part of parents sometimes to, uh, well, let me back up here just a second. Uh, it's the difference between jumping ahead and jumping in. So parents are often inclined to jump in, and when they see their kid headed for something that they can see they're, they're not going to succeed at, it's going to be difficult or whatever, they're inclined to jump in and rescue them from that situation. But the better approach is to jump ahead and say, I can see this is going to be a struggle for them. It may be uncomfortable, it may be painful, but it's not going to be damaging. I'm going to let them deal with it and give the kid a chance to acquire some skills in the process of doing that. So as, as parents, our goal is not to protect our kids from every discomfort or every frustration, but to help them learn how to deal with discomfort and frustration. And you can't get better at doing something by not doing it. So you give them opportunities to challenge themselves and sometimes not measure up and to, to recognize and be reaffirmed uh, by their parents that failure is not a, a terminal event. It's something that occurs on the way to success. Mm -hmm. The only way you do that is by having an opportunity to fail. So when I was a teacher like 10 years ago, um, the, the phrase uh, helicopter parents was really popular at that yeah, time. Yeah, the, yeah. the parents who were always hovering above their child, yep. watching everything, and then ready to swoop in and rescue them at any moment's notice. Jumping in, yeah. Uh, and there's a there's a, a, an awesome leader named Tim Elmore, mm -hmm. and he talks about how helicopter parents, it's like, we wish we still had helicopter parents. There's more and more parents that have become bulldozer parents <laughs> yeah. who, who are not hovering above. They're on the ground level, and they're not ready to swoop in and rescue. They're ready to bulldoze any obstacle yep. in their kid's yep. way, whether that's a teacher or a challenge or yep. whatever, to do that for their kids. Is this kind of what you're talking about? Y yeah, yeah, in the extreme. I mean, they're training their kids to be passive and, and to not be problem solvers, right? They're training them to look to somebody else to resolve their problems for them instead of doing it for themselves. So, I mean, the, the example I always use is, you know, when, when my daughter was learning to ride a bike, you know, the training wheels come off and I have two options at that point. I can run along next to her and grab a hold of the seat every time she wobbles, or I can say, wait a minute, go inside, get a wet washcloth and a couple of Band-Aids and say, okay, go, uh, and be there to pick her up after the inevitable fall, right? In, in the process of doing that, she learned something. I can't learn to ride the bike for her. I can't make her stronger by lifting weights for her. Those are things she needs to be able to do by herself. My role I see as a parent is to create circumstances where my kids can acquire skills. So this is so practical for me because if anyone listens to this, before Christmas, um, don't don't tell my daughter, but my four year old's going to get um, rollerblades. All right, <laughs> so my, yeah, I think it's rollerblades, and uh, it feels like a kind of a, a very dangerous gift for a four year old. <laughs> We're going to give her a helmet and pads and all that kind of stuff too. So you're saying um, allowing her to fall, like give a semi safe environment and allow her to fall. 
because mm-hmm. um, it's going to help her to learn how to do it right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Who? That that can the, be hard. Uh, when, when you when you see consequences that are potentially painful or uncomfortable, but you can foresee from an adult perspective. They're not going to be harmful. They're not going to be that thing that puts, you know, the, the last brick on the roof right. um, that makes things break down. Then, of course, you want to give them the opportunity to experience that. So my next question is this. There are, like, I know as an adult through COVID, like COVID was just, we've all talked about it a million times. It's such a weird period. It's like we went from just buying all the toilet paper we could and wiping down our groceries to like shutting down schools and um, this prolonged time of uh, not seeing each other's faces. And some of those may have been precautions that we felt were really needed at the time, but out of each of those, there were, I think, future tendencies in us as adults. Uh, we've we've seen in the last couple of years more people than ever running uh, onto sports fields when they're not supposed to. We've seen more... Air, um, situations of airline um, unruliness than ever before in our country's history. Like, we as adults are figuring out how to be social again. Yep. Um, and Or, or not. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is that the case for our kids as well? Are there tendencies that might stick out in our kids subconsciously or consciously? Um, yeah. I mean, I th- by and large, the effects on adults and kids are similar. But as you suggested at the outset here, kids are more likely to bounce back given the opportunity. So then it's incumbent on the a- adults to create those opportunities. I-, I mean, the reality is uh, in terms of you know how COVID works as a disease, I think out of the million or so deaths from COVID in the country, about 1,400 were among people age zero to 17. Mm. So 1,400 out of a million, the risk of death is vanishingly small for young kids. And yet we behave as if they're at the same level of risk as I am as Mm -hmm. an old person. Uh, And it's just, it's simply not true. So then, you know, we end up getting all over helicoptery about that. And that level of uh, interference, I guess, makes people anxious. So we, we do that to our kids, right? So they have the same tendencies and they will react in the same way, but in the same way as Benton bounced back from his broken arm, they'll bounce back more quickly, provided we stop putting bricks on the roof. Right? So the bricks are on the roof and maybe some of them are being removed mm-hmm. over time, um, but for different kids, it's, it, it, it's probably different for every person. Um, and so what you talked about anxiety earlier, um, but what are some other themes that we may see in our kids um, and even in our adult behavior that um, to help identify those and, and know like, nope, that's not a regular or, or healthy response. Right. Um, what are some of those themes so that when we see them, we can identify them and help to change them? So, so, Major changes in a kid's behavior without any, you know, identifiable thing in the environment that immediately precedes that. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if a kid stops wanting to do things, if they start wanting to sleep with you, if there are major changes in their um, eating or sleep habits, if they seem more withdrawn or lethargic, they don't want to go outside, if they complain to you about not feeling good or they complained a lot about you know, stomach aches or headaches that don't have any apparent medical reason, those are good indicators that there's some stress going on, um, uh, particularly if they withdraw from social interactions. Um, they don't want to see their best friend. That's concerning. Um, I, I mean, those would be the big ones on my list. Uh, the, you know, Ordinarily, we would talk about if their academic performance is declining, that's a little tougher to measure because, in general, academic performance de- declined mm-hmm. uh, through COVID. We lost something like two years' worth of development in um, math and, and science um, over the course of that time. And that those effects are more profound for people in lower socioeconomic status. Um, uh, they are more likely to be 
changeable in younger kids because we've got time to, to remediate some of those things through the educational process. But kids who are in high school and missed out on their last year and a half of high school, uh, it's harder to go back and remediate those things once they've gone into the work environment or, or somewhere else. So, so if we see these themes, um, they're not eating. Uh, they want to hop in bed with mom and dad. They're anxious. They're asking questions. When are you going to be home? Are you sure you're going to be mm -hmm. home? If we see these type of themes, what should we as parents do? <laughs> that's a little bit of a bigger question than we have for the next like 20 minutes or, uh, or whatever. And that's really what the, the you know, a lot of my work um, is about. Um, but it's essentially so just, just bring, bring them all to you. Tim. Yeah, do that. Just line them up in the parking lot. Okay. That's um, th the biggest thing is, is awareness as a parent. And if you're seeing things that look different than what you remember pre COVID, try to reestablish those pre COVID patterns. And, and if you're just reliable, consistent, structured, you've got a good, uh, disciplinary strategy. How are we going to approach those kinds of issues? Um, chances are pretty good. They're going to bounce back. But if after a period of time you see that that's not happening or it's getting worse, then yeah, it's reasonable to look for some kind of uh, professional support. So let's go into one of these specific examples. So um, we'll say my kid um, has been wanting to hop into, into bed with mom and dad and, uh, at first, it was like, oh, whatever, it's just easier because I don't want to get up and move you all the time. And But now it's starting to become a theme. Um, so what do I do? Uh, it, it, whenever you're saying it's just easier, there's a pretty good chance it won't be easier in the long run, oh, right? That, that you're succumbing to sort of short-term pressures and potentially building a longer-term issue. That's especially true for things like... Uh, bedtime. Uh, if you, I mean, there are a number of potential interventions for bedtime, ranging from go in there and don't come out, or I'm taking your iPad until you're 25, <laughs> uh, or uh, you know, I'm going to stay in here with you for 10 minutes. I'll stay in here with you until you go to sleep, and you do that mm -hmm. for a few nights, and then it's the next night. It's well, I'll stay in here with you for 15 minutes. And uh, then 10 minutes and then, you know, sneaking out earlier. Uh, it might be in some cases kids need some kind of a more directed motivational system for, you know, you stay in your bed all night. This good thing happens for you mm -hmm. the next day. Um, you make sure that they're good and tired, that they're motivated sleepers. So they've got a good sleep environment. It's quiet. It's dark. It's, uh, you, you know, uh, um, comfortable bed, all those kind of things that are conducive to sleep. And then you you know keep them up and active for a while, and then put them into bed right. and, and say good night and, and get out. It, it, just, it depends on the kid. So another example, I just read an article yesterday, and I I had never read this before, but it was um, someone saying that uh, you talked about eating if their eating habits change, mm -hmm. and they were saying that um, forcing a kid to try different foods is actually child abuse. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know if this writer has kids of their own. Um, I, I'm going to guess not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but there was a lot of like empathy online with this article of of people saying, "Yes, my parents forced me to do this, and I still have food trauma whenever I see peas or squash or whatever." And I just I just kind of read the whole thing with an kind of an open mouth, and and I. And so we, so my wife and I, we we're not part of the clean plate club, mm -hmm. but we do say you have to have so many bites to try it, and if you don't want it, then you you don't have to finish that for today. Um, and then I read this article and I thought, am I abusing my kids? Because their their eating habits, part of it is just kids. Yeah, is like they phase in and out of certain yeah. foods. But uh, so, am I abusing my children? Well, probably, but not in this particular case. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Take it back, Tim. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, people don't eat things that they never try. Um, and, and so I don't have any problem with saying, well, the, the first book that I wrote is called First the Broccoli, Then the Ice Cream. So that should give you some indication, right? It's which is kind of a, a stand-in for the idea of do what you need to do, then you can do what you want to do. Eat what you need to eat, then you you, know, you can eat what you want to eat, right? 
Um, and, and you also, in a more general sense, I mean, it's not a good idea to put kids in charge of their own environment uh, entirely. Um, so, you know, my the, the sort of the approach to, to meals is that there should always be two, at least two options, take it or leave it. Yeah, so th- these are good practical ideas. So if we see our kids changing um, their eating habits or their sleeping habits, you said if, if we say it'll just be easier, chances are down the road it's not going to be easier yep. for us. Yeah. So find ways to help our kids cope and figure these things out, walk with them so that they can figure it out, and then let them do it on their own mm-hmm. so they can learn to fail, fall down in a safe way that's not going to crush the Toyota. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is this has been really helpful and encouraging. Um, I think also there there is a connection to this, like as a Christian of when we're in a tough circumstance or not, um, we we have hope through Christ. What Christ has done for us through His death and resurrection, that we are in the midst of something on the way to eternal life, and uh, having that hope is helpful for me as a parent. To know, like, okay, if I, if I'm observing these things, I do need to help them overcome them in a healthy way. Um, but also, like, this is a phase. This isn't the end. Mm-hmm. And even if my kid was stuck in this for a year or longer, I have just hope in general um, because I've seen what's been done for me, and I know that there's problems I've had for years that God has not given up on me in those problems. Um, and that's helped me to be a little bit more positive, patient with my kids, even though they're struggling. So my question out of that is really, um, what if it seems as though we we put in these healthy tools and there isn't a quick fix? Okay. What do I do then? I mean, if I've been working weeks or months and my kid's still not sleeping in their own bed or they'll still object to anything that's not chicken nuggets. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there ever a time where it's like succumb and move on? Or or like what do we do when it feels like our hole has been dug too deep? Well, I'm I'm with you. I don't think the hole is ever too deep. I mean, we're we're different from used Toyotas. I mean, we it doesn't matter how long we've been stuck, we always have the chance to get unstuck. It, it doesn't matter how long we've uh, been uh, uh, you know, out of the light, we can always step back into the light. That's always an opportunity. Sometimes it takes a little extra nudge. So I don't know that there's a definitive answer to when is the right time. I just believe that attentive parents know things aren't getting better. Um, this doesn't seem right to me. And, and that's when they start looking for some professional help. And that doesn't necessarily mean you... You, you make an appointment at a clinic somewhere, it might mean you do a little bit more reading or you talk to people who have been around the block a, a couple more times, grandparents or, or uh, people with some uh, understanding of how children operate. Um, uh, and, and then, you, you know, you take their advice and you apply it and, and try to move forward from there. So there's, I wish there were a, a more straightforward single answer to that question. There really isn't one. Mm-hmm. I, I think the biggest one is trust yourself. And if your perception is this is not going well or something is seriously off here and I've tried to remediate it and I, I don't know how. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, if your kid has a cold or the flu, you keep them home, you nurse them through it, they get better, you go on. But if they've got, you know, malaria or, you know, some dread disease, you know, 24-hour leprosy or something like that, you don't, you don't try to fix that yourself eventually you go and get someone who has specific training in dealing with those issues, and that's um, you know, a, a child psychologist or a behavioral psychologist. For, for the anxious parent who needs to become unstuck, um, is 24-hour leprosy still around here? Because <laughs> they might have just, their blood pressure just went up. Yeah. <laughs> Something new to think and look for in their kids. So um, we've been about two and a half years in this fight or flight COVID moment in history, Dr. Tim Riley, the expert, are we coming out of COVID or is that something we never will? What's going on? 
Yes and no. Um, it, yeah, there's every indication that there are going to continue to be variants and subvariants. Um, the usual sort of long-term path for a virus is that it becomes more contagious, meaning it's easier to catch, um, uh, but less uh, uh, virulent, meaning it, it, it's not as likely to kill you. And, and the reason for that is that that's the most advantageous spot for a virus. If a virus spreads quickly but kills everybody it infects, then the virus has no hosts uh, going forward. So typically, over time, they will gravitate in that direction. I mean, part of the problem is that we've interfered with that process a little bit. And, and there's always a chance of some rogue variant um, that is, is more deadly. Um, there's a big problem with China right now because they've been on lockdown so long, and now they're kind of coming out of that. They're not uh, well vaccinated. And so there's very likely to be kind of an explosion of COVID in the near future in China, and then that implies you may get some other strain that spreads. So very long answer to the short question is, no, we're not out of it, but we don't want to arrange our entire lives around COVID in, in terms of the most dramatic effects, probably, at least in my estimation from what I read, that's probably done. Um, uh, the vaccines do a so-so job of managing it. Really, COVID is a, uh, at this point is a disease of older people. Um, about 90% of the people who have died from COVID are age 65 or older. And, and as I mentioned earlier, a very small, small, you know, much less than 1% um, uh, of the mortality is uh, among kids 0 to 17. So it's probably going to be something more like the flu, which has been with us since 1918. Uh, we deal with it year by year. Some years it's worse. Some years it's better. Some number of people are going to die, unfortunately, yeah. um, each year. Um, but we compound the problem if, if we, you know, focus our entire life efforts and circumstances around uh, uh, around a disease that really at this point has limited impact. So I hear what you're saying. I'm going to start bringing my kids back to the trampoline parks. <laughs> I mean, actually, I've been doing that for a while. So I guess the last question I have for you for this topic of um, parenting out of COVID, are there any other practical tools for us as parents – to help in this season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I think as I suggested before, the main thing is just, just be a parent um, uh, and create as much predictability, as much continuity, as much security of routine and associations and traditions and, and all of those things as you can. Make things as normal as you possibly can for the kids. Um, and, and, you know, keep adult concerns among the adults. Kids don't need to know about all of this stuff. They've heard plenty about COVID already. For the most part, kids are more concerned about what's right in front of them at the moment, um, you know, whether or not they're going get, to get to hang out with the kid up the street than they are about some, uh, from their perspective, hypothetical disease. So we do those things. We manage behind the scenes. We do what we need to do, but otherwise look as... Uh, normal for lack of a better term as we can yeah I, I think normal looks different in every home but the uh, tools you're saying of um traditions and consistency and those um that's super helpful as a parent uh dr tim riley thank you for walking us through this topic of parenting out of covid um families uh we love you keep keep being intentional with your kids um, giving them the tools to achieve and and then to fail on their own and to overcome and then to be there to cheer them on. And uh, this has been helpful for me in, in picking up some new ideas and a healthier perspective on uh, what, what it's been like for the last two and a half years. So thank you for contributing to this conversation. My pleasure. All right. This has been another podcast going beyond Sunday. Uh, thank you for joining in. Have a great day. Yeah.